deconstructing the past to help you make sense of today. Time for another award-winning episode of Pre-Nicene Perspective with your host, Darren Kalama. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us for the second episode of Who's God? It's the new FBN series where we contrast and compare the Hebrew Old Testament Torah deity with our New Testament Christian God as revealed to us only through Christ. Today we're going to be taking a look at Judges chapter 11 verses 30 through 39. It's the Old Testament Torah story of Jephthah, one of the kings of Israel who ruled from 982 to 976 BC. Now what makes him interesting is he vowed to his war god Yahweh that if Yahweh gave him victory over a rival gang called the Ammonites, he would kill, dismember, and set on fire the first person who walked out of the door of his house to greet him when he returned. Now, this would be done to thank and honor the war god Yahweh for helping him defeat the rival gang. And it worked. He won the battle. And the person who walked out of the house to greet him in celebration when he returned was his only daughter. Now, after she begged him to let her live an extra 60 days, he agreed, and then subsequently, ritualistically, murdered her, chopped her up, and burned her remains. It's obviously a very touching and heartwarming story that should be on Netflix. And on the 60-day stay of execution, did she start by asking for 90 days and he haggled it down to 60? Did she invoke the friends and family discount clause on Hebrew child sacrifice? Sadly, we're only left to wonder about these important religious details. Anyway, before we dive into this, let me just interject quickly and address a couple of items. Yes. We're aware that there were no biker gangs during the Bronze Age. But I think you'll find as we move through our deconstruction, biker gangs are a fairly apt, a fairly fitting description for what we're talking about. Now, whether it be the Israelites or any of the other tribes they warred with in the region. Now, these rival biker gangs included, but were not limited to, the Amorites, Ammonites, Canaanites, Philistines, Babylonians, Assyrians, Moabites, Edomites, and the Amalekites. Now, I was going to sneak in some trilobites in there, but better judgment prevailed. Now, these biker gangs were all ethnically related and could join the other gangs if they pledged and made vows to the war god of the new gang. And each tribe or gang had their own god. Some had more than one god. It varied depending on the beliefs of the gang. Some gods specialized in fertility, some death, some war, others in weather-related events like storms or rain. The names of the biker gang gods of the region in no particular order are Baal, Molech, Chemosh, Yahweh, Ashtoreth, Ashtorah, Zebub, Dagon, and Marduk. Now, the Israelites, the Jews, selected Yahweh as their war god. And as an example, we'll highlight further in a minute, the Ammonites selected Chemosh as their war god. Now, these two biker gangs and their gods would soon clash as the backdrop to our Jephthah vivisection human sacrifice story. But first, we need a little context on the Israelite gang. They were monolatrous. And that's a fancy word for people who believe that many gods exist, but that their god was the most powerful of them all, and that sacrifices, both human and otherwise, should only be made to their specific god. They should treat the other gods with respect, but only sacrifice to and worship their god, Yahweh. Now, their belief system is made crystal clear even today as you hear my words in the first of their Ten Commandments, although technically there were 613 Hebrew commandments and laws, but I don't want us to get lost in the weeds right now, so let's just focus on number one. Quote, Thou shalt have no other gods before me, unquote. And by the way, right about now, a little light bulb should be flickering on in your brain. Does the first commandment say, 
I am the only God? No. This Yahweh recognizes that there are other gods, and it is jealous of them, and wants all the sacrifices made only to him, Yahweh. Now you might be saying, whoa, Darren, that's a lot of projection. Who are you to say that Yahweh is jealous and that he's jealous of other gods? You're ascribing a human emotion to Yahweh. How dare you? Well, that's fair enough. Let's go to the tape and crack open the Hebrew Old Testament. Let's have a look-see. Quote, For you shall worship no other god, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous god. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous god visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me. Next. For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. For the Lord your God in your midst is a jealous God, lest the anger of the Lord your God be kindled against you, and he destroy you from off the face of the earth. Next. The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries and keeps wrath for his enemies, unquote. And of course, we find all that in Exodus 34, 14, Exodus 25, Deuteronomy 4, 24, Deuteronomy 6, 15, Deuteronomy 5, 9, and Nahum 1, 2. Now, if this were a courtroom, we'd have a verdict and all be on our way to play tennis by 1030. But you know what? I'm going to go full pro bono on this one. Let's stay on the clock a little longer and review what the Jews themselves say about all these gods that they believe in. The Jewish scriptures consistently refer to the existence of the gods of the nations, the other biker gangs in this case. Deuteronomy 6.14, do not follow other gods. Deuteronomy 29.18, to serve the gods of those nations. Deuteronomy 32.43, Praise, O heavens, his people. Worship him, all you gods. Isaiah 36.20, Who among all of the gods of these nations have saved their nations? Psalm 8.21, God presides in the great assembly. He renders judgment among the gods. And in the history of the Jews' exodus from Egypt, Yahweh battles against the gods of Egypt to demonstrate who controls nature. Now, this makes little sense if their existence wasn't recognized. And then finally, we have the coup de grace. I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. And we find that, of course, in Exodus 12.12. 12. Now, by now, even for Judeo-Christians and those who suffer from the cognitive dissonance of what I like to call the Hebrew haze, it should be glaringly obvious that Christianity, Jesus, our faith, and our Christian God has absolutely nothing to do with Yahweh the war god and his wandering biker gang. But you know, sometimes it's hard to let go and make a clean break after a lifetime of indoctrination and brainwashing. It could happen to anyone. And before I go any farther on today's deconstruction, I'd like you to know that the answer isn't to abandon faith. The answer is simply to turn back again, come home to the first Christian Bible of 144 AD the Bible with the Gospel of the Lord, and the Apostle Paul's original ten epistles. Now, you won't find the Old Testament Torah in it. No Yahweh war gods and biker gangs doing human sacrifices. But you will read about Jesus descending from heaven and arriving on earth in human form. There's not going to be any stories about oversold hotels and two Jews in a horse stall in Bethlehem. Now, you can get that original Bible free at theveryfirstbible.org.org, and you'll also find a home at themarcionitechurch.org. Now let's backtrack quickly to Yahweh and his jealous rage. Maybe he had a reason to be jealous. After all, he was just one of many gods worshipped by the Jews at one time or another. In fact, another king of Israel, Solomon, built a high place, an altar, to Chemosh, the Ammonite war god on the Mount of Olives, facing Jerusalem. And the religion was officially sanctioned in Israel. We find that in 1 Kings 11.7. Now, after the official toleration of this foreign religion, children were burned alive on the altars of 
Tophath in the valley of Hinnom, immediately south of the city walls of Jerusalem. And we find that in 2 Kings 23.10 and Jeremiah 32.35. In fact, King Ahaz of Judah sacrificed his own sons in the fires of Gehenna, the name often translated hell and adopted by the Jews to describe the valley of Hinnom. And he wasn't the only one. There was another one, King Manasseh. And we find that episode in 2 Chronicles 28.3 and 2 Kings 21.6. Now, let me boil this down. That's called human sacrifice, like the Aztecs, except with a more phlegmatic accent. And there's more. Now, the Baals, B-A-A-L, were endemic in Canaan when the Israelites arrived. But the spread of Baal worship owed much to intermarriage with foreign women who worshipped the Baals. Now, you may remember the most celebrated example of this was when King Ahab married the Phoenician princess Jezebel in around 874 BC. And Jezebel imported the trappings of her own religion, including the priests of Baal, Melkart, the Baal of Tyre, her own hometown uh, people, and persecuted the prophets of Yahweh. And we read about that in 1 Kings 16, 30-33. Now, ball worship not only involved ritual prostitution and degrading sexual practices common to many of these fertility cults, but it also included child sacrifice, and we read about that in Jeremiah 19.5. I mean, you can just feel the teachings of Jesus oozing out of these people, can't you? So let's recap. Inter- and intra-tribal warfare, all marrying each other, all related to each other, killing each other's women and children, dedicating monuments to and worshipping each other's gods, doing human sacrifices to all those different gods. Really a reptilian way of thinking and barbaric way of life. A Mad Max wasteland of psychopaths and egomaniacs and Mogadishu-style warlords, all vying for the same shot shiny objects and natural resources and sex slaves. Now, you still think that's our Christian God that they were worshiping? Well, flush out your headgear. You have as much in common with Allah and Vishnu as you do with Yahweh and his Hebrew war god biker gang. I mean, I just think you have a right to know who these people are. When their alien Hebrew religion is stapled onto the gospel and words of Jesus Christ, as it was done at the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD, and that's when Christianity was officially hijacked. Okay, let's get back to our story and our hero, Jephthah, and Judges chapter 11, verses 30 through 39. Here it is, quote, and Jephthah made a vow to the Lord and said, If you indeed give the Ammonites into my hand, it shall be that whatever comes out of the door of my house to meet me when I return safe and sound from the Ammonites shall be the Lord's, and I shall offer it up as a burnt offering. And Jephthah crossed over to the Ammonites to do battle with them, and the Lord gave them into his hand. And Jephthah came to his house at Mitzvah, and, look, his daughter was coming out to meet him with timbrels and with dances, and she was an only child. Besides her, he had neither son nor daughter. And it happened when he saw her that he rent his garments, and he said, Alas, my daughter, you have indeed laid me low, and have joined ranks with my troublers. For I myself have opened my mouth to the Lord, and I cannot turn back. And she said to him, My father, you have opened your mouth to the Lord. Do to me as it came from your mouth, after the Lord has wreaked vengeance for you from your enemies, from the Ammonites. And she said to her father, Let this thing be done to me. Let me be for two months, that I may go and weep on the mountains, and keen for my maidenhood, I and my companions. And he said, Go. And he sent her off for two months, her and her companions. And she keened for her maidenhood on the mountains. And it happened at the end of the two months that she came back to her father, and he did to her as he had vowed, and she had known no man. Unquote. Well, that's very nice. It's like a Hallmark card, except with human sacrifice and screaming. Now, if you watch the first Who's God episode called 
Hebrew WrestleMania, you know we deconstructed the story of Jacob fighting with and beating Yahweh the war god in a wrestling match. And one of the things we pointed out is that the story was actually plagiarized from Greek mythology, a crude cut and paste job of the story of Antaeus, the Greek god of wrestling. And lo and behold, we find more plagiarizing, this time with our Jephthah story. And again, another cut and paste job straight from Greek mythology. This time the character is Idomeneus, a Cretan general that had asked the gods to calm a storm. And then he promised in return that he would sacrifice the first living thing he saw upon his safe return, which turned out to be his son. Sound familiar? And the worst part, adding insult to injury, is that you're told this crudely written plagiarized nonsense is the word of God. To which we ask, who's God? I'm Darren Kalama, gagging and dry heaving my way through their demonic scribbling so that you don't have to. And for all of FBN's award-winning content, including TV, podcasts, news, and radio, visit firstbiblenetwork.com. We'll see you next time. Kill them all, old and young, girls and women, and little children. Does that sound like something Jesus would ever say to you? The first Christians didn't think so either. And that's why you won't find the Old Testament in the first Christian Bible of 144 AD. Reconnect with your pre-Nicene Christian roots and the Bible you were meant to have. Ten books and the Gospel of the Lord. Download your free ebook at theveryfirstbible.org.